let me say, just to show how spontaneously I operate, exactly the same words that I began with, which is good evening and welcome to this webinar, which is the third, is that okay for sound? Yes, staged by Thank our project you. on populism and constitutional democracy, which is run by Adam Chamota, Wojciech Sadurski and myself, and is funded by the Australian Research Council. Our subject, the subject of our discussion tonight, is a stimulating and deeply provocative book, which was awarded the 2019 Best Book Prize by the University Association for Contemporary European Studies for the book that has made the most substantial and original contribution to knowledge in that field. Uh, the book's title, every word of which deserves and will get today some analysis, is Counter-Revolution, Liberal Europe in Retreat. The book's author is Jan Zielonka, Professor of European Politics at the University of Oxford and Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Venice. He's with us uh, wearing a rather natty t-shirt and jacket. Jan joins us from Tuscany. We've invited two extremely distinguished discussants, Professor Saskia Sasson, who is the Robert Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, and who, we hope, will be able to join us uh, from London during the session. She is keen to, and uh, we don't know where she is and why she's not with us, but we hope that will change. And our second discussant is Professor Pola Cebulak, who is Assistant Professor of European Law at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, she joins us, zooms in from Poland. They're joined by my chief co-chief investigator in the Constitutional Populism Project, uh, Wojciech Sadurski, who is pro Chalice Professor of Jurisprudence at Sydney University and Professor in the Centre for Europe in Warsaw University. Uh, he is presently coveted in Sydney. I'm Martin Krieger, uh, Professor of Law and Social Theory at the University of New South Wales. We had hoped that Adam Chalmota would also be with us but unfortunately, he could not be uh, due to personal reasons. So again, we're delighted that uh, so many of you have turned up and tuned in from all over the world. And again, that means, as it did in the earlier seminars, that we have had to formalize the Q&A somewhat. Those who wish to ask a question should use the chat function, either to type your question or to write that you would like to speak. Dr. Carolyn Evans, who is our project coordinator behind the screen, will coordinate the questions. And if you have any technical difficulties, you could send a uh, private, uh, sorry, send a, an email to uh, Carolyn. The email is invisible, but there on the screen. Uh, and, and I should remind you that the session is being recorded and the recording will appear in a few days or a week on our website, Global con pop, it's all one word, dot blog, as well as on YouTube with John Lennon and various others. So let us start. Counter Revolution, that is the book, is a pacey, engaged, hugely well informed, sometimes savage, and always sharp response to current European and indeed global travails. It discusses structural transformations, ideological blind alleys, geopolitical, cultural, and economic insecurities and anxieties, institutional dysfunctions, and personal inadequacies, perhaps central among them, uh, persistent failures of imagination. Jan cites in the book a reviewer of his earlier book, one of his many books, but an earlier book, is the EU doomed, and that reviewer calls him an intellectual uh, provoca provocateur. It's a good phrase, and Jan seems more than comfortable in the role. Counter-revolution is short for a book, but long for a letter, which is the form it takes, written to the late and great German-British sociologist and once mentor to Jan, Ralph Darendorf. And so my first question 
to set the scene and find out the character, for those of you who had not had the chance to read it, of this book, is to, to young. Writing a book in the form of a letter is an unusual strategy, particularly when the recipient is dead. So why did you choose it? You know, if you, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you in Sydney, even virtually. I wish um, I could rejoin you once again uh, in uh, um, uh, the Sydney Uni or UNSW, but we have to wait for this uh, till the end of this terrible pandemic. But uh, to answer your question, if you are a boring academic, you have to find a way how to reach a broader audience. And, uh, and one of the, the way to do this is, is, is to have a more personal narrative. And a letter allows you to do uh, just that. And of course, I haven't invented uh, the form of a letter to discuss major political problems. Edmund Burke, in fact, during the French Revolution, wrote a letter to a friend in Paris. Ralph Darendorf, who, who you mentioned, wrote a letter to a friend in Warsaw when communism was collapsing. So I um, basically have chosen a letter uh, to Ralph to, uh, to see where this uh, uh, liberal revolution he, he described in his book um, is uh, 30 years later. Right. Okay. Well, 30 years has turned out to be a tumultuous period, even though we might have thought once that it, it would be less so and less surprising. And you don't hesitate in the book to describe the present state of Europe and indeed the world as one of crisis. Indeed, not just one crisis, but many. Even when you wrote in 2017, the list was daunting. If I can quote you, European officials used to say that Europe comes out stronger from each crisis. This time, however, we're faced with multiple crises, each reinforcing another with no plausible solution in sight. The list of crises is long and ever growing. We have, that was then, a banking crisis, a debt crisis, a currency crisis, a growth crisis, a crisis of inequality, a crisis of cohesion, a crisis of work, and above all, a crisis of imagination, which means we have no idea how to get Europe's economies out of the current mess. Well, some of these crises have changed, but as the world knows, we've had a few more now. Uh, and of course, crises come in many forms, but you focus in your title and in your book uh, on a particular aspect of these crises, which is what you call a counter-revolution liberal Europe in retreat. Why that title? Why counter-revolution? Why liberal re Europe in retreat? It relates exactly to the, uh, uh, the book Ralph Darendorf wrote um, after the fall of the Berlin War. He was talking about the re liberal revolution, which uh, 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 the fall of communists uh, in Eastern Europe allowed to be extended to, to the entire continent. This liberal revolution started much earlier in, in Western Europe, but, but after um, 1989, it sort of uh, moved uh, further east. And although Ralph never subscribe uh, under the end of history thesis of, of, of Frank Fukuyama, he indeed believed that, uh, that, that we are not going to return to, uh, to dark years of uh, authoritarian politics where liberal ideas were simply put aside. And, and what he and many others at the time uh, saw is that Liberalism was not just a, a device of 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 of, uh, of of dividing power between uh, courts, uh, parliament, and 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 the government, 
it was not just about uh, press freedom. It was um, about many other things. In a way, it was about defining normality. It was uh, um, about uh, the way we judge what is good, what is wrong, what is rational, what is stupid. Uh, it, it moved to the field of culture. It, 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 it basically defined how we interpret history. Even the way we talk and move was in a way li liberal to some extent. So, uh, so I argued that liberalism has become a, a, an ideology of power. Uh, uh, defining the notion of normality. And what uh, uh, those people uh, uh, um, uh, uh, who started, you know, what the illiberal politician uh, started to do is basically to question everything, the whole package, not just one uh, of the aspects. They, they said, no, it, it's, it's also about the way you define family. What is family? It's the way you look at history. It's the way you, you teach at school. And, uh, and so it is not just about the independence of constitutional court or uh, of freedom of the, of the press. And those people were always there. So this was not particularly novel. Le Pen, uh, uh, father won elections to the French parliament already in the 50s. Uh, we very well remember when Jörg Haider joined the coalitions of, of, of Prime Minister Schussel in, in Austria and how uh, painful experience it was. And in a way, I, my colleague from Rotterdam, uh, I was at the time at Leiden University, uh, uh, economist Pim von for, uh, Town has become a, a kind of prototype of, of, of a populist politician at the time. But the difference uh, uh, is that those people never had a chance to, to, to form a government. They were not really winning a sizable electorate. And in recent years, they started to win uh, at the ballot box. Uh, and I started to write this book uh, after the Brexit referendum. This was uh, the, uh, the reasons I started to reflect about the crisis of, of, of liberalism. And then I realized that similar things were happening in other countries because I look at my native Poland uh, uh, and I've seen uh, what has happened after 2015 uh, um, uh, elections um, in Poland. I, I look at Hungary, I look at Italy where I always live part-time, where politicians uh, like uh, Beppe Grillo or Matteo Salvini from totally different angles uh, uh, were questioning liberal principles too. So I realized that this is uh, serious, that this is fundamental challenge and not cosmetic one. And, uh, and therefore uh, it is a kind of counter-revolution and not just a, a quest to, to change the government, so to speak. Paula, could I ask you, uh, there are many things you can call both the crisis that uh, generates responses, but equally characterize the responses. And Jan, for reasons he's just told us, thinks the counter-revolution captures this. Does that make sense to you? Does it does, is that the best way to get a handle on what's going on? I'm, uh, I, I wonder about the concept. I mean, I see the, the connection to Darendorf, so I don't want to kind of, maybe that also kind of then questions calling it a liberal revolution indirectly too. But I think especially for the counter movement, I feel like it nearly uh, elevates them because I'm wondering whether now there is also a lot of literature about backlash against the liberal order. And backlash in, is in a way, I would say, a, a step below. Backlash is rather a retrograde movement kind of that is uh, focused on bringing some kind of, uh, bringing backwards some changes that, that happened. And uh, it's also a movement that kind of gradually reaches the mainstream, like with some kind of extraordinary tactics and goals. 
but it rather in a piecemeal process uh, reaches the mainstream. And I wonder here whether counter-revolution for me would be different in the sense that it would suggest not only going backwards, and people also disagree whether we go backwards in a neo-medieval way or in a neo-fascist way, or in a, where do you kind of pinpoint this uh, backwards looking ideologies. Uh, but a counter-revolution for me would be rather proposing something constructive, again, from the general usage of this concept. And also in terms of the piecemeal gradually reaching the mainstream, I would see a counter-revolution not in a way that kind of gradually reaches the mainstream, but rather that maybe even organized by a minority, but uh, takes over the kind of institutions of power, uh, rather from a minoritarian point of uh, support. So I'm wondering whether you're not kind of uh, giving them too much uh, fame by calling it a counter-revolution. Yeah, would you like to respond? No, look, uh, uh, I have to say I haven't invented this term. Uh, and in, in modern context, it was used first by, by Jaroslav Kaczynski, the leader of peace. He called what he, what he does a uh, counter-revolution. Uh, so it was handy for me. But I, you know, for those of you who just finished a, a book or a PhD you want to make in a book, Remember um, an advice I've got from, from my publisher many years ago, you need to have a Google friendly title. If I would call my book a backlash, you wouldn't organize this web seminar probably. We certainly would. We certainly would. Now, though the counter revolution or backlash suggests a focus on the people doing the countering or doing the backlashing, uh, that is not your prime focus, as it turns out. This is a book, as you say, about liberalism, not about uh, the counter revolutionaries. And in particular, you say it's a book about liberalism, not about populism. And you're rather uh, short, uh, swift, I think, with rejecting the notion that they should, that the counter revolutionaries in Poland, in Hungary, uh, in the United States, in uh, Britain, in, ma in many other countries, should be called populist. And of course, as you know better than most, there's a huge literature which does call them populists. Why, why are, you, are you reluctant to do that? No, maybe first I should explain why I didn't write a book about populism. I haven't done it because in 2016, uh, where I started to write this book, there were already uh, a numerous terrific uh, works uh, on populism, some written by my, uh, by my very close and former colleagues like Kasmode or, or Jan Werner Müller. They, they've done terrific job in writing about populism and, and, and I couldn't compete with them because uh, 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 this is something what they've done all their life, particularly Kasmude. Um, but this, and, and at the time, what, what, what was for me very puzzling is why we all talk about them and we don't talk about us. It takes two to tango. You have to, un you have to ask yourself the questions, why citizens who were voting for liberal parties from the center left or center, center right, uh, for, for many decades, they, they just uh, uh, gave us a support time and again, why they have decided to, to, to change positions in, and vote for these illiberal parties. This was for me important. And you can, uh, you can uh, argue, yes, because those populists are so charismatic. Well, I, I don't think they are so, so brilliant, so charismatic. I, I, I find most of them mediocre politicians you know, Victor Urban, who is here the, the most uh, prominent among them, is, is a big fish in a small pot. It's, it, you know, he's unable to, to change European politics and, and, and we see it as, as, as we speak at the Euro, European top. He can be a nuisance, but he, 
he, he has the only strategy he is is to to cover his local cronies. You know, uh, you can say as many uh, argued those voters are just uh, stupid. They 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 have been manipulated by by populists and uh, and uh, and therefore um, you know they uh, they just. Uh, a, a basket of deplorables, as 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 uh, Hillary Clinton called them, right? Well, this is uh, too lazy explanations. Let's put it this way, and it is not very democratic because in in democracy it is the, it is uh, these are the citizens and uh, who are who are sovereign, and and not uh, uh, those who run for the office or or, or, or write op eds in newspapers. So I, I basically assume that, that you need to, to tango. Yes, it has something to do with them. And, and some people wrote a very interesting um, uh, um, uh, books and articles about them, these populists. And it's time also to look, at, uh, some of them abandon us. And, and this is how I uh, decided to write about this. Today, it is not any longer so revolutionary. Uh, many works uh, appeared since, uh, uh, and, and, and they are still appearing. Look at the latest issue of, of Prospect magazine, for instance. But, uh, but when I started to write this, uh, it was really something liberals haven't done very much. Right. Paula, did you want to into? Yes, I wanted to ask still because I, I see that for the purposes of your narrative, like treating like liberals is a, as a big kind of uh, stream uh, makes sense to uh, to unfold your argument. But whether you think that the left right wing divides within the liberal camp kind of matter at all. And I'm thinking that also in many European contexts, this uh, more extreme, more kind of populist or nationalist uh, parties, they also emerged from their kind of left or right wing uh, mainstream parties, that they either ruled with them in coalition governments at first when they were still kind of small parties, or that even on a personal sociological level, many of these politicians started their career careers in mainstream Christian democratic or social democratic uh, parties. So, so uh, and there I think maybe the left right wing af affiliation matters a bit more for, uh, for also their kind of political origins. So in generally whether- There are many cleavages. I, I never declare that left uh, right cleavage is out. Uh, I believe it still is, but so so are the cleavages between the urban and 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 and, 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 and provincial voters, for instance. So uh, so are the uh, so you can in Europe these maps of, of of unity and diversity is very complicated too because different preoccupations are in debt or countries or credit or countries and and so on. Uh, but. Um, you know, at certain moment, you you cannot just talk about uh, individual trees. You have to look at the forest. And in my view, uh, um, what was striking in recent years is that 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 exactly bashing liberalism and 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 liberal politicians have um, uh, been electorally uh, uh, rewarding for for these people you mentioned. And you can call them uh, populists. You can call them counter-revolutionaries. You can to uh, call them uh, extreme right in most cases. But uh, but, uh, uh, but there is something unites them in those different countries, in my view. And this is that that bashing liberal ideas uh, 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 is you know is 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 rewarded rewarded. Uh, and we've seen this in America, we've seen this uh, in Italy, we've seen this in, in Poland, and this is what's puzzling for me. Well, can I then go to the core, which is uh, liberals? 
you say repeatedly that this is, as you call it, a self-critical book by a lifelong liberal. You emphasize that you are a liberal. Uh, and at the same time, and part of the charm and part of the sort of disconcerting power of the book is that your fellow liberals get a lot of flack. Uh, someone wounded by your criticisms, some liberal wounded by your criticisms, might be moved to ask, with friends like that, who need enemies? So of course, the neoliberals also do have enemies. Uh, you say, in the last three decades of liberal rule, if the last three decades of liberal rule was such a great achievement, why have so many people started to hate liberals? You say the reasons why ordinary citizens are today disillusioned with the liberal type of democracy are many and they're legitimate. So since we have another lifelong liberal in the uh, panel, I want to move to Wojciech. What's your reaction? You're a self-professed liberal and one of your Polish books of essays has the uncharacteristically self-deprecating title, No One Loves a Liberal. Uh, which may now turn out to be true. But why do you think that's so in general, if you like? And in the more cl complicated case of Jan, since he's a liberal, but he doesn't seem to like liberals too much uh, and is one of its, of their profoundest critics, at least in the European context, but much more broadly, because one of the richnesses, the rich, yes, richnesses of the book is that while its central focus is Europe, it's dealing with pro problems which really are uh, besetting us all, even down here at the, at what our prime minister once called the ass end of the world. So you think that, uh, how would you respond to the many and pungent criticisms of liberals, of European liberals, of Polish liberals uh, in, in, in the so look, uh, I consider Jan's book to be by far the most brilliant, eloquent, erudite, interesting instances in a genre which is quite burgeoning now, which I may call the liberal self-flagellation. And I'm saying it without irony or sarcasm, there is nothing wrong about self-flagellation. Certainly it's better, much more virtuous than flagellation per se. Uh, to be sure, self-flagellation may be a symptom of certain psychological dysfunctions, but uh, like masochism, for instance, but I may certify as someone who has known Jan much, much longer than anyone else in the panel and probably anyone else in the audience that Jan is not no masochist. He's not, not even ascetic. You know, he's a <laughs> joyful, pure hedonist. Uh, so this grim nature of his argument has no connection with the character of the author. But even, you know, self-flagellation virtuous and noble, though, though it may be, and Jan has just restated it a moment ago, okay, everyone is talking about populists, how about if we liberals do some introspection and look into, into mirror ourselves, uh, it may carry with it certain pitfalls or certain dan dangerous temptations, uh, which sometimes it's hard to resist. And I wonder whether Jan has managed to resist those temptations successfully. And I'm thinking about three in particular. So the first one is to attribute to liberals certain things which have nothing to do with liberalism, which are sort of contingent, which just happened, which may have been unwise strategies or moves, but which were, which had no inherent connection with liberalism of the decision makers or politicians or governments that conducted. So I think for instance, about Jan's critique, perhaps right, perhaps wrong of the European governments military interventions in neighboring regions in Syria or Libya or Afghanistan, etc., uh, which we now with the benefit of the hindsight may criticize, but which were, which had no special connection 
with the liberal ideology. So they were only very, very partially sort of typically liberal humanitarian intervention. They were based on certain arguments of geopolitics, which again, may be right or wrong, but it's very difficult to blame liberalism for that. The second pitfall or dangerous temptation is to somehow depict liberalism in a, I would say, stereotypical fashion um, using certain cliche or certain conventional wisdoms of anti-liberals. So that when at certain point in chapter two, Jan accuses liberalism, now these are my words, not his, so I'm paraphrasing, uh, of being insensitive to the values of community, of nationalism, national loyalty, etc., uh, and that somehow liberalism is doesn't have this sense of yeah, sensitivity to the importance of community and togetherness, etc. I, as a liberal, I must protest. I mean, I mean, the most important liberals whom I've read were very, very sensitive to community. So it's not so much that we dislike community and elevate an atomistic individual. We just don't like some types of communities. Communities based on caste or sort of hierarchy, irrational hierarchies where there's no right of exit, et cetera, et cetera. And we propose different communities, communities which are based on autonomy, which renders community even stronger uh, because it is always uh, underwritten by the right of exit. But my main point, and this is my third and, and perhaps the most important objection to this self-flagellation is the implicit, but sometimes even express statement that it is our fault, our weaknesses, our failures, our, that is liberals, that should be blamed for the victories uh, and triumphs of what Jan calls counter-revolutionaries. And here I need to say a word about this whole uh, characterization of counter-revolutionaries, because not just as Yannick sort of uh, anecdotically said, you know, they wanted me just to use a sexy word in the title. I mean, the whole theme and the whole logic of, of the book is to depict the defeat of liberals against counter revolutions. Now, if you depict your enemies as counter something, then you say that the only thing that unites them is negative. That is whether they are Syriza or peace or Orban or Erdogan or whoever, you know, they are more or less in the same basket because they are counter 1989 revolution. But I think that adopting this perspective renders it very difficult for us to actually give a proper account about the varieties of those people. And, and in that sense, I think populism does a much better work because it's much more context sensitive. And it may tell us where we, have, we may have different populisms which are not only counter, they are not only anti, they also supply to the population something that the population expects, something positive. Whether it is protection of their economic grievances or whether it is support for their traditionalism or religion or identity, whatever, it is positive rather than purely being counter, being, being against us. And secondly, this approach that we should somehow make better sense of who they are, those counter revolution, not being just counter, but giving the voters certain positive assets, argumentative political assets, etc. 
allows us to avoid this sort of self-flagellation typical approach. They are, they win because we lose, you know? They are doing so well because we are doing so badly, to which I say, well, maybe not. I mean, why, why, why presuppose that there is a zero sum game? Why presuppose that they are winning or that their victories are only because we are so pathetic? Maybe not. No, maybe uh, they are doing something against which we have absolutely no remedies. A little bit like the force of nature, you know, this is the matter of agency. This is not charisma that Yannick just mentioned about that. Of course, Orban is not charismatic and Kaczynski is not charismatic, but they had given something to their societies, which, which the majority of electors or at least plurality, large plurality of electors actually liked. And we must make sense of it rather than saying it is our failures which account uh, for their victory. So to, to sum it up, I would say uh, it may well be, we must at least presuppose this, assume, this hypothesis that whatever, they, whatever we did, they would have won. And maybe it's not just our deficits, but yes, let me end with this point. We should not necessarily assume that voters are wise and the voters are right. This is a long standing conversation, personal conversation that I've, I had with Jan over the years where he said, you as Democrat, you cannot say voters are stupid. And I say, yes, sometimes voters are stupid. They are duped, they are misled, they are indoctrinated, they are tempted to run selfish, egoistic, angry, anxiety-based politics, and we should assume that also, at least as a hypothesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, look, uh, the first uh, observation is that liberals form a very broad church. You see here uh, 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 two men grown up in the same part of, of the world at the same time, both self-proclaimed liberals and with totally opposite view on, on this particular matter. And, uh, and I can assure you that, um, that, that the, the, the differences of opinions among liberals are even greater if you move uh, to different uh, geographic uh, contexts or age groups or, or gender. Uh, Second, if, if you are in power, as liberals were, uh, a, a lot of kind of uh, uh, people jump on the train because they think they can earn money or make career. Uh, and, and of course, you can say, well, I have nothing to do with those liberals. And you can uh, say, um, yes, uh, this was, uh, we have nothing to do because there is a Deus Ex Machina, something, uh, I don't know how uh, Wojtek put it, uh, the, 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 the force of the nature who made us invade uh, Iraq or, or, uh, uh, or, or allowed, uh, for instance, uh, uh, torture. Uh, uh, in, in even such uh, countries run by 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 uh, liberals uh, like Poland, right? Uh, but that is not the point. You see, I'm a political scientist uh, 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 by training, and I try to look at the evidence uh, and asking myself why those voters, and we can discuss uh, their nature, but those voters have shifted from us to something else. And, uh, and then you have to ask yourself, who was in power when inequalities were just rising and, and, and reaching a, a historical proportion? Who was in power? They were not populists in power. They were liberals in power when it all happened. It didn't happen overnight. Today, everybody, to, you know, uh, talks about inequalities and the need to address them. And Piketty's book 
which uh, has, I don't know how many tables and figures and, and several hundred pages, which in France earlier on uh, couldn't sell, now is a, a world bestseller. But where were those people talking about inequalities when liberals were in power? Uh, uh, you, you mentioned in military intervention. Uh, but, but, but I remember the, the slogan of, of, of going to Iraq without UN mandate was under the, 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 the slogan freedom. This was Operation Freedom. If freedom is not the quintessential liberal term, you know, then what is it? Uh, uh, and, um, and you can go on and on, uh, 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 basically seeing why people turn away from liberal uh, parties uh, without even those populists, because we preached one thing and we've done another. And of course, I'm not stupid. I understand that those decisions are sometimes very complex. I also understand uh, that, that most of my liberal friends in Oxford would not uh, associate uh, themselves with uh, no liberal economics of Mrs. Thatcher, right? But as it happened, and you know, <laughs> Thatcher was conservative liberal, and people around her, right? And um, uh, you know, you know. But the most important thing here, what I want to say is, and here's the major difference between me and and Wojtek, is that what I've done, I thought it is always the most noble tr liberal tradition which is self-criticism. These are autocrats who do not lie, do, cannot face self-criticism. Liberals are we're always good about this. You mentioned, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, communities issues or so. I mean, in different times, people like Selznick, who, who, who I look at Martin now, wrote many, <laughs> articles uh, uh, saying that liberals is, is, is too much focus on individuals and neglects community. So I didn't invent this. Uh, I, our friend uh, Stephen Holmes did the same. And you know, this is a normal thing to do uh, within liberal circles. Autocrats are afraid of, 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 of looking to the mirror we were supposed to, to have the courage to do this and self-correct things. And this leads me to the last sentence. You know, if you believe that all this was because of the forces of nature and it has to do with them, not us, how can you regain public trust? How can you win back to the voters? How can you correct policies if you don't try to understand what went wrong? And I give you an example of, of migratory policy in Europe, at least, right? What, you know, migration is as old as humanity. Look, to, read the, the, the Bible, right? But why we been uh, faced with such a migratory crisis uh, uh, um, uh, over the years in Europe? Particularly recently, we abandoned basically development aid to those countries which are poor and desperate around us, particularly in the South. We, uh, we withdraw investments and, and abandon the idea to, to sponsor, you know, uh, uh, private engagement because we thought it's, it, it, we're not us anywhere. We sided with autocrats in most of those countries in the Middle East, in North Africa, and largely because we just wanted that they keep these people, you know, away from Mediterranean shores. You know, when those people rebelled in, in during Arab Spring, we just turned our back uh, uh, towards this and, 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 and un unfortunately even in some cases sided with autocrats. Then we bombed some of those countries. Libya is a very good example. I remember, 
you know, like Berlusconi was 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 talking and welcoming Gaddafi as his great friend and so. But then, you know, we bombed Libya. Then we left those countries in the hands of local war warlords. And then we we saw those those countries' arms as much as we could. And then we were surprised that people are fleeing wars in Syria, in Iraq, and other things. And and if we don't see this, we will never correct our policies. And what is our policy today in Europe of migration? A deal with Libyan warlords and Turkish autocrats to keep those desperate people in, as they call it, detention camps, but you could use the word, worse word where the whole idea that somebody can apply for any asylum is a fiction. I mean, this is something I cannot accept, you know? And if you don't look into the mirror and understand what went wrong, you are never able to, to make right policies. And it is not just that those policies we've followed and still pursue are illiberal. They are simply stupid. Could we then look into the mirror on one issue which you take up several times as a kind of characteristic, characteristically liberal uh, element or pathology within liberal democracy, and that is disempowering people. You emphasize many times that within uh, European states, there is a tendency to depoliticize decisions, to give them to institutions like central banks and courts increasingly. And then within Europe, overarchingly, uh, that, for example, decisions about accession, Europe were largely a matter of executive deals which were not taken to the people. And this is a, a, a democratic critique of what you take to be, as I understand it, a, a kind of liberal, maybe not a core liberal value by any means, but a kind of liberal tendency or pathology. And you ask a key question, how does one empower citizens? Because you say that citizens have been and have felt that they are disempowered in current circumstances. I wanted to ask, Paula, who knows a great deal about European institutional developments, how you carry how how you accept this, or do you accept it, and how you would characterize, and in particular, because our time is is running on famously, but eventually we were going to have to stop. And I did want us to ask a little about uh, prescriptions, the future. So this is a kind of segue between where we've been and maybe where we will get to. Hola. Yes, I think it's indeed also a bit about uh, yeah, how kind of um, the liberals could kind of uh, reinvent themselves or the things that you a bit kind of ask in the last chapter. So uh, I wonder here, I mean, one aspect is what you already mentioned, like the kind of uh, promoting stability versus uh, democratization. And you said about it rather in the European neighborhood, but also within Europe or within the enlargement policy, this is also something that, uh, that has been happening, whether with uh, um, the populist uh, leaders in Western Balkan or uh, even with Viktor Orban within the European People's Party. So whether that's something that is more kind of inherently liberal to kind of, uh, or inherently conservative to kind of push towards more stability, this preference, or whether that's something more because liberalism became the ideology of power and uh, because it's more about uh, creating this normality and maintaining this normality. And uh, also, obviously, then there's the question that, uh, now with the hindsight uh, of the last few years, we do have uh, counter-revolutionaries that have come to power and uh, uh, that have taken up governments uh, differently from the examples you mentioned. And how do liberals respond to this situation there when they find themselves 
in the opposition. And uh, here, obviously, you have also in Europe, they respond nationally, but they respond also through the institutions of the European Union. So I'm wondering how you look at the responses, because that would be one of the things where we could imagine that liberals could kind of reinvent themselves around democratic values. And I would say that what we've seen in terms of responses, European liberal responses to democratic backsliding in Poland and Hungary, this was largely a failed attempt if we um, would see it as kind of uh, at uh, reinforcing uh, liberalism around democratic values. Because what we've seen was uh, rather this uh, value weakness uh, that you also described, this kind of ideological low-key element of liberalism that uh, has surfaced. And there we see, I mean, we see it across all kind of types of governance in the European Union that you have more the, uh, that you don't have the democratic values kind of, and the enforcement of democratic values is not enshrined in the constitutional treaties properly. I mean, we have this article seven that has never been used uh, where we need um, uh, all of the other countries to agree on suspending a member state. At the intergovernmental level, we have had a stale stalemate and we still have, even now when we are discussing conditionality for rule of law funds, the majority is very tricky and is very fragile. We, uh, so I would say that at the intergovernmental level, we don't have an agreement of uh, uh, a broad compromise of all other states. And at the more supranational um, technocratic level where we have the European Commission, I would say that they also clearly differentiate between their legal strategies that they go before the court of justice and pursue some very specific narrow violations of EU law and their political strategies where they do soft law, they do mostly diplomatic dialogue, they do rule of law uh, framework where they exchange letters with uh, member states. So uh, even though I, I, I am also hopeful that maybe in the last months we see some developments, but mm, if we look at uh, the last nearly decade of these responses, I would say it's still a bit of a bleak picture of uh, reinventing uh, liberals around democratic values in Europe. Yeah. I don't know, you want me to respond now or, or, or you want to add other people to jump in? Because no. I don't want to talk too much. Uh, You're the mayor. Our uh, distinguished public, but you are. Well, well let, let me then uh, hold it and maybe. Could we end with one theme, though? Uh, we've had three seminars and they're all a bit sad. So we had uh, John Keane talking about new despotisms, which are jumping up all over. Very often, these issues have overlapped. We had um, Stephen Kastev and Stephen Holmes talking about the very, very uh, unsettling power of, of imitation in the geopolitical scene, which seems to afflict uh, many of the, and, and attend, many of the catastrophes about which you've been talking. And up to now, your book has sounded to be of the genre, but uh, maybe not surprisingly, but it's a certain different tack that you take in the book. You say liberalism may be down, but it's not out. The neoliberal detour has done much damage. But there's no reason to abandon some core liberal credos, liberty, individuality, control, power, and progress, counter-revolutionaries lack a pro plausible program of recovery and renewal. I believe in a happy ending for Europe and even for liberals. Uh, this letter is about healing or reinventing liberalism. And this is the power of positive thinking. This is this can lighten the heart, but it's not the temper of a lot else in the book. And I wonder if you could cheer us up, it's near Christmas, uh, by telling us a little what gives you this somewhat restrained, optimistic 
or was openness to optimistic possibility that much of your book uh, would tell against or might be thought to tell against? No, look, uh, I never uh, believed that populists will do any good. Uh, and, uh, and we see that those who came to power did as badly as I expected, if not uh, worse, right? Whether this is good news or bad news, uh, 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 I'm not sure, because uh, if you look at the cost of the pandemic uh, in countries run by populist government, it's, it's really uh, 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 frightening. And those costs will only mount in, in the years to come. So far, there were, we are counting that, but we will soon be counting, uh, you know, economic costs because governments spent money they didn't have. Um, so, so in this sense, of course, they allow return of um, of liberals now in in America. I expect uh, uh, in Poland the current government will fall uh, very soon. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, and and in Italy, they even without elections were able to get rid of Salvini. So uh, this basically um, give a hope for optimism. But here I would I I, I, I would be very cautious. Uh, you know, it very much uh, depends. Uh, if Biden, Obama three, or is it something novel? Because if Biden proves to be Obama three, we basically for taking people from old Obama administration and uh, and and continuing policies Obama uh, uh, started. Well, uh, I I fear that this may lead to uh, Trump two or something even worse, right? Uh, or, or different versions of, 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 of this. Uh, 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 the same in Poland, you know, if this government will fall, it is, will not fall because people are impressed uh, uh, by, by the liberal opposition. No, it, it is because they see how incompetent uh, and malicious this government is. Uh, which, which brings me to the point of discussion uh, uh, with Wojtek is that I see very little uh, um, uh, kind of appreciation of mistakes liberals have made. I see very little uh, kind of uh, effort to renew uh, program of liberalism. And I see in generational terms, a very dangerous phenomenon of, 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 of liberalism seen by young generations as something old fashioned and, and, and really irrelevant. You know, Oxford is, is not a, a, a progressive place, let's put it uh, bluntly. And yet, uh, um, uh, hardly any of my students uh, would call themselves liberal. And, 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 and certainly uh, those uh, 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 women protesting now in Poland, uh, uh, I don't think, you know, they, they fight of course for, for, for freedom, but, but they wouldn't call themselves liberal, I fear. And so this means that, that of course, ideas of, 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 of liberals will live up, but, but liberals as, as a kind of, um, ethos, if not uh, ideology, uh, uh, you know, will uh, will need some time to, to recover. And for this, you need, first of all, to understand what went wrong, to, to get rid of people who screw it in the first place, and, and then start a program in, you know, which which is plausible enough for the electorate, and and here, and here's the last sentence I want to say, is that if you are liberal, you know, how, however terrible 
it may sound, you are not after a new utopia. You are supposed to, to, to believe that process is as important as the product, that policy is about a trial and error, and you always have to, 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 to try test your, your political prescriptions with your base. Uh, uh, so you have to allow more participatory uh, 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 decision making. And I haven't seen very much of this, if only because uh, why, when liberals started to lose the electorate, they even got scared of elections, let alone you know, participatory <laughs> democracy. Uh, so there is a problem here. But in my book, as you've noticed, I adopted longer term perspective. I didn't think that it can be fixed within five years. I thought it would be 10 and 20. But what I haven't uh, envisaged is this, this tremendous uh, shock of the pandemic, uh, which uh, uh, is enormous challenge for the liberal order, because what the pandemics made governments to do, to carp or all uh, individual freedoms, and and to run governments by by decree in autocratic fashion with very little evidence and and consultations and 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 this is something what worries me tremendously, partly because uh, some of those governments are of course misusing those powers. But also because uh, if this is the new normal, you know, this uh, you, I'm speaking to colleagues in Australia who, who, who happily do not have to worry about COVID uh, now uh, very much. But uh, this one will stay with us at least for another few months. And then there will be another, another virus because, you know, in China, similar viruses were already three times in this century only. And then there will be other shock of antibiotic resistance and others. So I, I, I have a feeling that this is the threat, maybe not so deadly as Alexander, Alexander Dugin, the Putin ideologist, they triumphantly announced the, the death of liberalism because of the pandemic. Maybe it is not a death of liberalism, but this is a, a certainly a very complicated factor. And we don't know how it will affect liberal agenda. So far, I have to say, um, I have cold, cold fields, but I'm born optimist. Um, I'm not sure I'm hedonist, as Wojtek said, but I'm certainly optimist in the long run. But people can say in the long run, we all that. And I welcome yeah. Saskia, who certainly can jump in on that. Now, Saskia, we, we have a problem that uh, our time is almost up and we have to move to questions. So I'm trying to think because we were so keen to have your input. I have one question which, uh, which I would like to put to you. If the audience, which can't really resist because, except by leaving, uh, will tolerate a little extension of time because I'm so pleased that you've, you've got to be here. Uh, the focus of the book, uh, which we've been discussing, is on Europe, of course, and several of the processes it describes are literally global, and they affect us all. And you, as uh, who knows more than anyone on the planet about many of these processes, I wanted to ask you specifically about the one moment where uh, Jan mentions your terms, your book, and then uh, works with them, where he says, the same, uh, given the past two or three decades, we've come to realize that the that progressive globalization and Europeanization have generated a new constellation of territory, authority, and rights. This is an explicit uh, reference to your celebrated book, Territory, Territory, Authority, Rights from Medieval to Global Assemblages. 
He says, Jan says, this could not but affect democracy. We're being invited, if not forced, to reconsider the relationship between demos, the people, telos, purpose, and kratos, power. So is that how you see it? Uh, you have a rich and complex account of the interrelationships between and the transformations of demos, telos, and power. What's happening here? And does Jan's account seem to you satisfactorily to, to uh, capture these trends, these huge trends, as, as you understand them? And please, enlighten us. Um, so, so for for, I mean, one one critical element that simplifies a bit the explanation for me is that um, the borders that we have, yes, they're still there in law, but operationally speaking, there are a series of transversal events. Uh, that are rupturing those borders with great facility. It's as if those borders might not exist. Now, these transversal events are very partial. They don't occupy a whole country. So the, the whole question of what is national sovereignty for me is in play. When you think of, if you take the most extreme cases, you know, very advanced uh, um, sort of economic sectors probably is one simple example. They are really cutting across, they have constructed new geographies that are very partial geographies, but that with enormous ease cut across all kinds of borders. And so in that sense, there were a whole set of elements in Zilonka's book that I really found very, very engaging, you know, because it is as if we are still in a way existing under certain formal conditions, et cetera, the international system. Uh, but in fact, there are all these other systemics that are also in play. And one has the sense, or at least one sort of, you sort of smell it a bit if you want, that this is the beginning of new formations because they are different from the formations we might have had you know, 50 years ago. And at the same time, they are not threatening. There is something that is not threatening. It is as if distinctive sectors, some very attractive, yeah, you know, intellectuals, etc., others less attractive, big business people, are each existing in a kind of condition that is partial, but that cuts across many different countries or, you know, sovereign countries, really. And so that is what, what I was sort of getting at a bit in, in, I think, in one thingy that I wrote. And I, I find that we must take this seriously. We must try to understand what is constitutive in today's world. A lot of what belongs to the nation state is no longer constitutive. It's still hanging in there. You know, it's like having all kinds of things in the house that you no longer use. Uh, but there is this other trajectory that is emergent. And that is what, what, what I was getting at. And how, do you, how does that uh, relate to, or what are its implications for the kind of the thrust of Jan's book that uh, this project, this European project, this liberal project in Europe and the world, yeah. which seemed so triumphant in 1989, has fallen on such hard times. Yeah, so that is one perspective. You see that you look at it, it fell on hard times. Another perspective is, let me check out what are the elements that are still in play, but that now inhabit a new format a format that is partial, it doesn't involve nation state sovereigns. It is partial, but it, cut across, it cuts across many, many, many different elements in many different countries, but always partially. In other words, the notion of the nation state is partial today, but it is also operational in a way that is novel 
and that is the capacity to cut across uh, with very partial, very specific, in, in some ways one might say very selfish uh, aims. This is not the generosity, you know, the original generosity supposedly embedded in making the sovereign state, the sovereign state with its powers, its responsibilities, you know, its seriousness, its recognition of all citizens in there. No, I think we've lost that a bit. But we have something else. And that something else is a, is a whole set of transversal entities that have their own, and I don't mean just firms, eh? I, mean, I mean also assemblages of how people think, whether they know it or not that they share that with others, you know, but certain modes of thinking, certain modes of appreciating, certain modes that are becoming increasingly unacceptable. You know, so it is that kind of, of image that I sort of had in mind and, and that, that Jan's book made me think of that in a way. Uh, I, I had it already in the back of my mind, you know, I've long worked on that, but I saw it suddenly in, in, more, in a more constitutive way, not just, okay, these are all these transversal things that are, you know, inhabiting our planet. Uh, I saw it as something that is actually emergent and has its own constitutionality, if I can use that word. Um, and that I found interesting. And there could be very good things there. Certain, certain groups, certain types of uh, people or situations can benefit from that. And others would not like it at all because there is going to be a loss of centralized power. Centralized power is what loses here, you know? But the question is, is all power gone? Hell no. It, I'm sorry for using that language. <laughs> I sound like a, like a fishmonger or whatever that expression is. Uh, but, but it is then this other cons these other constitutive elements that are generating, and I think by, that are generating these transversal ter territories. Now, these are, these are to some extent also closed territories. Not everybody can participate in all of these things. Most people are actually out. And then the question for me becomes in, in the conventional mode, are most people actually also out? Not in the good European countries, but when I look at the Americas, oh yes, most people are out. They might as well be citizens of who knows what. They're, they're, they're simply not in play. Right. And so then, then back to these transversal things, how can we make those work? Because I think that is on the agenda, frankly, huh? that, that these transversal, and I must say, John's book brought a lot of this stuff in, not in his, this is not his language, I know that. But since, we're, since we're, we have very little time, I'm just using directly my language, I'm not intermediating. But I see in his analyses, the, these, uh, these elements, I began to think about these elements by reading his stuff, you know, so, so where is Jean? Jean is there? Is he yeah, there? He's there. He's there. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, these themes are fascinating and they're also themes that are central to Jan's uh, prior book, Is the EU Doomed?, where he stresses the uh, levels and range and option uh, and, exactly. and alternative ways of organizing that he yeah. thinks will take up will mean that the that Europe is not doomed but the Europe of nation states or a collection of native nation states might be now I, unfortunately I have to bring the actual discussion yeah. of panelists to a close to give uh, our patient audience a chance <laughs> to intervene and please, uh, now the, the orchestration, the choreography will be handled by Carolyn. And please, if you have questions, she will have some of them already on chat. And if you wish to, well, you know the rules. Carolyn. Yes, if anyone would like to speak, um, raise your hand or put the question in the chat session and I'll make you up to a panelist so that you can speak to us all and be visible. If you would just like a question put to one or more of the 
uh, speakers. Uh, you can just type that in the chat box and uh, I'll voice that for you. Um, so who's going to be the brave first hand raiser or question asker is the big, big thing in front of us now. Thanks so much. That's, uh, that's, that was absolutely fascinating about yeah this whole talk of transversal reason and do we... Can we really have a liberal democracy without constituency, not constitutive forces? Yes, yeah, Saskia Aska spoke so beautifully about constitutive forces, but can liberal democracy function, operate without constituency, without not constituent power, but simply community of people who share these values, who want to disseminate these values, and who want to um, enforce them. This is a big question for Europe, whether it can have the dictatorship like Hungary or autocratic regime uh, like uh, Poland uh, uh, as its part. But uh, my um, uh, more general question is, didn't COVID actually in, um, prove that the state is still of vital importance? And uh, this is the legitimacy by efficiency. It's only the state that can handle the pandemic. It's not the European Union that can call for the state of emergency. So the state actually proved how important it is at the time of pandemic. And what is more worrying is how uh, this efficiency, legitimacy by efficiency, is completely unrelated to the values that the state is built on, whether it's liberal or authoritarian. Extremely successful Vietnam, China. Yes, yeah? so my, my bigger question is, can we live without the constituency of values in this transversal global society? Yeah. You, but you're muted. I thought it was to, for Saskia. So I, well, I, would I think it's for you both, and I'm happy for uh, both of you to answer. Saskia, you want to start? Well, I would like, I would say that Jan should be the first answerer here. Huh? Okay. Look, uh, Ishi, um, the second question is for me easy. I wrote on, on, on this uh, uh, recently in various outlets, but uh, because the state uh, initially reclaimed sovereignty from both the European Union and, and regions and cities and, and, and uh, acted as this is uh, the only game in town. And very uh, quickly uh, they realized that this doesn't work this way. And if, you, if there is for me a lesson from, from this pandemic, it's exactly that, that, that the state lost some seats on this. And, and most of discussion in Italy where I'm now is how much the, the, the powers to run the, the emergency should be uh, divided between uh, a, a local council and regions and the European Union with state very much in the background. And this is the lessons I, I, I understand in the United Kingdom too, although your European context is, is different uh, after Brexit. But, uh, but as you very well know, uh, uh, the devolution uh, played an important role here. In, in Now, here you have to understand, I'm not uh, somebody who would say that one of these levels is, is by nature more efficient. I'm not uh, arguing like uh, my late uh, friend Tony Barber that, that, that if mayors would run a pandemic, uh, everything would be better. Nor do I want to say that, 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 um, that if the EU will take it over, it will be better. No, I just want to say that the pandemic basically showed that, 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 that first of all, pandemic vindicated public authority uh, as opposed to the private authority. This is the most important lessons, but, uh, uh, but the, this public authority is not just at the national level. It is for various reasons, both on the European and, uh, and, uh, and, and local, and in many cases also global, although we can discuss this. 
And, uh, and of course, uh, friends of, of, of the state will always say this is not true. You know, the states are still in charge and so And And I see, see here Stefan uh, Auer's uh, message that uh, and the bigger the state even the better. But I don't think this is uh, necessarily uh, uh, the lessons I drawn from this pandemic. But uh, and it is very much in line what what Saskia argued earlier. But but she may uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I agree. <laughs> you have to do more than that. <laughs> okay. Well, you know. Really, our if you look at long histories, I'm, I'm always very interested in, in, in origins. You know, how did something emerge? Uh, it could have been an innovation. It could have been, you know, whatever. And, and um, it seems to me that, that there have been epochs when the nation state as we know it now, though it is, uh, it is a transformed entity, but you know, at its best, if you want, th that was an interesting period. We had quite a few wars, you know, there were certain uh, elements that are part of that, some good and some very problematic. I have the distinct sense and I cannot fully, I'm writing about this, but I, I am not done with it yet. I have to do more work. I have the distinct impression that there is another logic that is emergent, that is going to be partial. Most logics are partial when you look at complex systems um, and that we don't have a name for it quite, but something is changing. Something is unsettling elements that were there and and I find when I look at, I'm a professor, right? So I deal with a lot of also young students. When I see how intelligent, the really intelligent, the ones that are really eager to understand, when, when these young students, you know, how they go at it, uh, there is something, it's just a different, and I've been teaching for 33 years. It is different, something, there are new logics in play. We don't have clear names for them but they are in play. And I found that in John's book, uh, though of course it is a totally different type of text from what I'm describing right now, there are these interesting moments that are really aha, you know, some aha moments in terms of revisiting that and, and the, the, you know, this notion of constitutional populism, et cetera, uh, takes takes a, it takes a takes a substantive meaning it becomes a substantive condition rather than just a title huh? and th that is sort of what struck me I must say and and um, I also think that a lot of the decay I see a lot of decay I see a lot of negatives in our system compared to a, a, a better period let, let's just think about our liberal, uh, Western style democracies for a bit. Huh? Uh, but at the same time, uh, enough years now of decay, huh? and there is something that is emergent. I have a sense, but maybe I'm wrong, that we do not have a name for it. We lack a name. We still are very bound by certain, by certain modes of, of describing and thinking. This question of constitutional populism, uh, is one version in a way of it, but I would like to find another term that does not have populism in it, that has constitutional, but not populism, but that at the same time what trans tries to capture a people, huh? the fullness of a people, the good ones, the bad ones, you know, the poor, the rich, you know, that, that, that whole mix that every country has. And, and, and I don't know yet, but I'll let you know when I get to it. Uh, what would be the name for this? You know, how do we name this new constitutional element? Um, so I really, I, for me, uh, the book was very interesting, though a lot of it has nothing to do with the type of work that I do. But it was, it was an interesting trajectory, an interesting sort of exploration of, of 
working with both, you know, familiar elements and less familiar elements. So I, I must say, I really like the book, Jan. I hope it's lovely to know. <laughs> it's also lovely to know that you're working on constitutional populism and you're going to rename it. And please let us be the first port of call for <laughs> publicizing and discussing your book. We would love to do that. Yeah. Now, Stefan, I believe, is, is waiting. Yes, I'm, I'm going to uh, wave goodbye to Yuji. And <laughs> Hi, Yuji. Um, Stefan is up. Here he comes. Ah, yes. You're still muted. You're muted. Uh, you're okay. beautiful, but you're silent. Yep. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the session, and I'm a great admirer of of, of Jan and, and his book so much so that I'm trying to write a sequel of sorts. Uh, but but I have disagreements, <laughs> and that, that is what I <laughs> focus on. Uh, it's narcissism right. of minor differences, uh, right? And, and and I want to also make a correction. The, the, the short, uh, uh, brief comments I, I wrote, I try to suggest that bigger is not always uh, uh, better. And for me, the pandemic shows that uh, the nation state uh, matters, it matters a great deal. Uh, but more to that, I think what helps is a sense of community, some kind of old fashioned demos that the German Constitutional Court uh, defended, you know, uh, for, for, for decades. And I would like to bring in Hong Kong experience, even though it's so different from everything, because I would try to also challenge what, what uh, Yiji said. The state is back big time. But the state is not enough uh, uh, for, for uh, a polity uh, mm. to work. Mm. So what I have witnessed here is quite remarkable because here uh, the public administration has no uh, legitimate authority. People despise uh, the government for reasons that you are familiar with. But when it comes to management of pandemic, this is the most successful story on earth or amongst them, right? They all Taiwan, etc. There is Australia as well, don't forget. And Australia, and Australia. But it was the strength of, of a community and the shared purpose, right? The, the society here pressurized the government to close the borders with mainland China. And, and, and equally so, Australia is an amazing example of, of Victorians coming together and, and defeating uh, 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 the virus, right? So for me, looking at, at the situation in Europe, it, it's just abysmal, like just varieties of, of massive failure. And now I'll come to one illustration that is a bit of a, 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 a speculation, but a varieties of failure, right? There, there is no better situation in the UK than in France or the other way around. What is the excuse that the Europeans have, right? Like the US is failing because Trump, right? But you don't have Trump in continental Europe and you have catastrophes on similar uh, scale, right? So I think it's the failure of national governments, failure of, of uh, uh, communities at, at city level, etc., but also big time a failure of, of, of the EU, right? Like early on, so much could have been prevented if the disease was contained. And that was the experience that China already made, right? And that all, only needed to be uh, replicated. Okay, they ignore Chinese experience, they ignore Hong Kong experience, but what is the excuse uh, uh, in not preventing the second wave that was entirely, entirely predictably uh, 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 kind of uh, going to happen? And, and now to, to one kind of, that, that speculation I want to put to you, and it won't make, make me uh, popular because I will say something nice about uh, the UK, right? Uh, that it is indeed possible that there is one, one positive uh, side to Brexit, and that is that for once the British state showed itself as, as, as uh, more nimble, as, as better equipped to deal with this exceptional challenge, and it approved uh, the, the vaccine that was invented, designed in, in Germany, is being produced in Belgium, it's uh, financed uh, partly by an American uh, multinational, right? And they approved it uh, uh, in a credible uh, way. I don't think that anyone challenges uh, their, their procedures, and they are likely to be at least a month ahead against 
uh, Europe where uh, the pressure to do it in a united way means that Germans who would certainly have the capacity to replicate uh, this regulatory uh, uh, kind of uh, procedure uh, as speedily as, as the British did, they have to wait until the European agency approves it. Uh, it's incredibly complex, obviously, uh, it's risk averse. And I don't know whether that level of, of governance is the most uh, appropriate uh, one, right? What you need is to instill trust in the people and people are more likely to trust uh, the German government anyway than the EU uh, agency, right? Uh, but for me, the, the main frustrating thing is that in relation to this particular uh, uh, story that thousands of people are, are likely uh, uh, to die. And if you share my belief that the vaccine is solid and it, it can help, uh, then, then it's just uh, really depressing to watch. Bigger is, is not always better and, and nation state underpinned by a demos that doesn't need to be ethnically homogenous, certainly not racially homogenous. Victorians are as mixed as anyone can be, but there is a sense of purpose uh, that that kind of uh, political community is needed more than ever. That's my view. Sorry, that was Thank too long. Perhaps. Anybody on the panel would like to respond to these stirring yeah. words, and particularly that Australia got into the picture is, is a, a gladdens my heart because it is a remarkable story in this context but please respond uh, well i i i think that as i signaled already i think that something foundational but partial has changed we don't quite have a name for it but we we sense that that a change has happened and this is not simply about, okay, a new building went up, not that kind of stuff. It's something more, more embedded in the system. It's not something that comes from outside, enters, you know. No, no, no. It's part of the evolution of a, the, the complexity of our, our system or our systems. And, and again, you know, that it's just a sense that I have because when I'm analyzing certain conditions, certain trajectories, I get to a, to a dead spot in a way very often. And that dead spot is what intrigues me because it means that I lack at this moment, the tools to capture something that is there. And we run that risk. We, we social scientists run that risk. We run the risk that we are totally engaged by an X and we are not noticing the rise of the Y, you know, just to, to get an image. And so in that sense, what I now, it's also partly because, you know, I grew up in Latin America and Latin America is a, is a, is a, is a continent of deep unsettlement. And there is a kind of unsettlement that is there that's very different from Europe. And so I am forever interested in detecting, you know, is something falling apart? Or is something getting stronger and more, you know, establishing itself? You know, is that kind of duality? And some of these are outcomes that we now know. Uh, I'm not going to detail because it, 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 there's no time. But others, we don't know. You know, I think there is, it is a kind of period of a partial unsettlement. And the virus, this dramatic event with no smell, no sound, etc., it sort of, it's a little thingy that is part of this, you know, but it, of course, it's unconnected to what I'm arguing here. But, but, but again, if you look at these long histories, uh, it's extraordinary to recognize on the one hand, how cities have existed for such an extraordinarily long period. And they have embedded themselves and inserted themselves or become part of all kinds of different systems of power, all kinds of different regimes. You know, so there is something about the urban condition that is about us, the people, and we need X, Y, Zs, and the city sort of gives us that. And then there are these other histories that are also in play, you know? And um, I don't know, when I was reading some of Jan's work, 
that came to me in mind, you know. It's not that uh, this is not his language, but, but these kind of transversalities that are in play, you know, that we often overlook a bit. Um, anyhow, I, I just, uh, you know, in Spanish, I would say I'm, I'm singing a tango. I'm beginning to sing a tango. You know tango, tango, tango? But it doesn't matter. But anyhow, <laughs> I really like talking. So I'm just going to be quiet now for a minute. We like listening. We have, one, we have time for one more question. And fortunately, we have one more question. And, and in, Hal, Hal Mai, and yes. I do hope that we can get him on. And then I'm afraid that though obviously this conversation could continue indefinitely. Some of you have to have breakfast, others have to have dinner. And we'll, we'll... So it was a great pleasure uh, to, to be part of this discussion. I enjoyed a lot uh, as I enjoyed uh, reading Jan's book. Uh, let, me, let me challenge, uh, not the author of the book, but rather one of the commentators, my old friend Wojciech. Uh, so this is the, the issue of whom to blame about the retreat of, of liberalism. You, you may remember uh, Joseph Weiler's piece uh, recently written about, about the people of Hungary who are to blame for Orban's power. So let me a little bit contradict to this, this approach, blaming the people. Uh, I admit Wojciech is right. Sometimes people are stupid. Some people are certainly stupid uh, uh, at elections, but I don't think that this, this can, can anyhow explain this story of success, either Orban or Kaczynski or, or anyone else. So here I, I would have two points uh, somehow as a counter argument uh, to, to Wojciech's uh, uh, approach. One is whether, isn't it rather a kind of, of, of neoliberalism, which, which is also one of, one of Jan's argument, uh, which escorted from the very beginning the liberal democratic uh, transition in, in East Central Europe. And liberal and socialist governments uh, up until 2010, very much used neoliberal politics. This made people very much uh, dissatisfied with liberal democracy. Of course, people can easily uh, equal liberalism and neoliberalism. Those are, those are not the same thing, of course, we know. But still, for the people, this can be one of the reasons of disappointment. The other point of disappointment, what Saskia has, has mentioned, uh, if she, she was thinking about that, this is a kind of populist constitutionalism. Uh, the lack of participatory constitutionalism, again, from the very beginning of the democratic transition. Paul Blocker uh, has a lot uh, about that. And you, you may argue that there was no constitutional culture in place in the beginning of the transition, but still the people had no say to any kind of, of constitutional arrangement about, about the arrangement of liberal democracy. So these are my, my two cents uh, in, in this discussion Maybe it's not that much of a question, but rather a kind of comment. Thank you very much again. Well, it's a very nice continuation of a central theme of Young's book. Uh, I hesitate to give Wojciech the last word, um, but I think that we should give Young the last word. And please, thank you. Well, first, be, so I don't get the last word. First of all, thanks to everybody. Thanks to the panelists. I'm so uh, delighted that Saski eventually could get in uh, against the technological barriers, and I'm glad for the 
for the uh, contributions of everybody here. Uh, we now have two more seminars coming up. One is Saskia when as soon as she finishes her book, and the second <laughs> one will be uh, will be Stefan as soon as he finishes his sequel to the young book. But uh, that's enough from me. I simply would like Jan to uh, bookend our discussion with any remaining thoughts. So first of all, I want to say uh, thank you. I was flattered to, to, to have opportunity to discuss with such great uh, group of intellectuals and also those who didn't have a chance to, to jump in because of technology, of course, if we would be in one room, uh, everybody would be able to 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 to, to take part uh, in these conversations more directly. But uh, but I think what Gabor said uh, uh, is a very good conclusion. The, the crisis of liberalism uh, has political aspects, very important ones, and, and economic too. But it is largely a, a challenge uh, to intellectuals. Most of intellectuals are, in one way or another, liberal, and 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 maybe we we, we haven't um, been doing well enough. And by this, I don't mean that we advise liberal governments are responsible for the things I mentioned in the book and discussion. Actually, liberal governments uh, didn't involve many intellectuals in decision making, but we somehow uh, 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 supported them because they were uh, closer to us than, than the alternatives. And, and we became complacent. We, we stopped asking um, uh, uh, very important questions, uh, which we should. And, and, and we, or as Saskia said, we we didn't tackle dead ends. We we, we just uh, uh, been maybe more happy with what we do, and and uh, and in this sense, you know, I always thought that um, uh, uh, that the Thatcherism is better than feudalism at universities in the sense that. Uh, that all this peer reviewing and competition is better than just uh, uh, your boss appoint, you know, deciding who is publishing and getting jobs. Uh, but, but in recent years, I actually thought that this is worse because um, we, we started to clone the same ideas and we started to be, to be self-referential. And, and very happy with our tenures and, and disciplines and, and not really challenging uh, uh, enough. And I, I think there is for us as intellectuals a work to be done. And, and I only, you know, I'm not an economist because, and here I finish, but Gabor asked about neoliberalism, but what was, when I read people who I really respect, uh, who, who criticize neoliberal uh, economics like uh, Stiglitz or Krugman, I realized that they are Keynesians or post-Keynesians, which, which tells to me that basically they apply uh, ideas invented for industrial economics to the digital economics. And, 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 and I wonder whether this is is the way to proceed. And these are the best ones. These are, they, they, they got Nobel uh, prizes and they, they are respectful, jolly good fellows. But yet intellectually I ask myself, can't we do better? And it applies to other fields too. So I, I'm, I'm very pleased we could discuss those things in such an open way, however, in a virtual way. And, and there is work to be done. And as I get older, I, it probably will make me getting up from bed every morning. And, and, and instead of uh, just uh, um, having a walk in the Tuscan hills uh, to read uh, uh, Saskia, Wojtek or, or, or Gabor and, and to reflect uh, what we can do still in the years uh, to come. This would be my uh, conclusion. 
Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Carolyn, for making it possible. And uh, have a good end of the year. Let's hope, though it won't be hard to low bar, that next year is better than this year. Uh, <laughs> and if it means the end of Zoom, uh, that would be a pity. I doubt that it will. Uh, and I do hope that we will continue, maybe not at this high level, but at least uh, we will continue having the discussions that we've got in train this year. Thank you very, very much.